skyrocketing health care and insurance costs, extremely modest gains against chronic disease, thousands die yearly due to drug reactions. What can be done? Thomas Edison is quoted as declaring, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but interest his patients in diet and nutrition, exercise, and the care of the human frame. He will teach them about the cause of all disease. The doctors of the future are here. Welcome to Phase 3 Wellness with your host, Keith Henry, MD, one of the doctors of the future. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me this beautiful Sunday afternoon on Phase 3 Wellness. I'm your host, Dr. Keith Henry. I'm a naturopathic doctor based in the Orlando, Florida area. I want to thank you for joining me today. We have a very exciting and insightful show as normal. Uh, We'll be talking about the, the, the chief, the lead off story or article we'll be discussing uh, is women who eat lots of fruits and vegetables lower their risk of breast cancer. Now, again, I am Dr. Keith Henry here every Sunday at 3.30. The majority of the time I broadcast live, occasionally I have a pre-recorded show, but probably 95% of the time, or if not more, I broadcast live. Now, again, I am a naturopathic doctor and I address natural medicine. Uh, from the perspective of wellness, from the perspective of healing the spiritual, the mental, the emotional, uh, and the physical. And from the spiritual perspective, whenever you hear me talk about natural medicine from the spiritual perspective, I will always address it from the Christian philosophy. Uh, all natural medicine will have a spiritual perspective. Some choose to address it from different other different spiritual angles. I choose to address it from the Christian philosophy. Uh, but I'll, we will follow the, the same outline that I follow every week. I just also like to just a programming note that you can also hear us now on iHeartRadio. The uh, the uh, the podcast will is listed there after we broadcast uh, uh, iHeartRadio and there are several other several all across the web there are other areas that you can hear us platforms uh, Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, etc. Also here on Blog Talk Radio, which is the platform that we use to broadcast. Uh, if you come into the show, any of the shows, if you came in, say for instance you're listening to this show uh, live, you come in late uh, uh, in the future, and you miss something, the the the, uh, the show, the entire show is typically typically available here on Blog Talk Radio in about 15, 10 to 15 minutes, the entire show. So again, thank you for joining me. And today, in our Week in Natural News segment, we will be dealing with three articles. And after the Week in Natural News review segment, we'll go on to the Healing Food segment as normal, and then we'll finish up with the Healing Herb segment. And to, again, the Week in Natural News review segment, segment I take uh, typically two or three articles that came out during the week and discuss and analyze them. This week, the first article that I will discuss, it will be talking about how women who eat fruits and vegetables have a lower risk of, uh, of breast cancer. And then secondly, I'll discuss an article that came out talking about how cancer is not primarily genetic, but it's primarily a metabolic, metabolic disorder, uh, which is I, I've agreed with all along. And thirdly, uh, I'll talk about some of the amazing benefits of one of my favorite supplements, COQ10. When I go over to the healing food segment, I'll be talking about the benefits of spirulina, which is uh, cons considered an amazing superfood. And then I close out talking a little bit about the herb hawthorn berry and some of the science behind it and how it works, how it works, and what it's used for, and some of the amounts that it should be taken in. Again, you are listening to Phase Three Wellness. I am your host, Dr. Keith Henry. Let's get started with our first segment. The first segment, or rather our first article from uh, the Natural News Review segment, is an article that was is taken from NaturalNews.com, and this article is again entitled women who uh, women who eat lots of fruits and vegetables have a lower risk of breast cancer now you heard me say here on phase three wellness consistently it's important to eat copious amounts of fruits and vegetables when we talk about the laws of health we talk about eating uh diet is one of the laws of health those laws being trust in the creator sunshine exercise water air rest diet and self-control or temperance uh, the diet that I advocate is a plant-based or a vegan diet. I get that philosophy first off from the book of Genesis and then also from just the science behind that diet. Uh, and so, again, 
the original diet for man, according to the book of Genesis, was indeed what we would call a plant-based or a vegan diet. Science has bared out that it is the optimal diet, no matter, you know, notwithstanding some of the other things that people tend to uh, to have come up with. It is indeed the uh, the ultimate diet. Now, in this article, though, it talks about uh, the benefits of eating these fruits and vegetables for women. Uh, now, the article says that statistics indicate that breast cancer is the second most common cancer in American women. It says that while death rates from this deadly disease have been steadily decreasing in most Western countries, a breast cancer diagnosis remain, remains both terrifying and dangerous. Medical experts have advised regular screening, lifestyle changes, and a healthy diet is the best ways to reduce the risk of developing this form of cancer. And a recent study has confirmed just how important eating lots of fruits and vegetables is in preventing this disease. The article goes, again, the article is found at naturalnews.com. The article goes on to point out how in this particular study conducted by a research team from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and published in the International Journal of Cancer found that, quote, a significant association, end quote, between increased consumption of fresh fruit produce and a reduced risk of breast cancer, particularly the risk of developing aggressive tumors. So here we're being told by this, uh, they found that by eating a, uh, a, a diet, women who eat a diet higher in fresh fruits and vegetables have a particularly uh, reduced risk, a specifically reduced risk of, of developing uh, uh, cancer with aggressive tumors. The article says that it was based on a 30 year, on 30, this study was based on 30 years of data. It says as reported by integrated practitioner, the research team, based their uh, meta-analysis on dietary questionnaires submitted every four years by 88,310 women to the Nurses' Health Study beginning in 1980. And then additionally, an additional 93,844 women who submitted questionnaires for the Nurses' Health Study too, which commenced in 1991. Now, as a result, this study found that women who consume more than 5.5 servings of fruits and vegetables each day benefited from an 11% reduction in breast cancer risk when compared to those who ate fewer than 2.5 servings daily. So again, that's an 11%, that's more than a 10% reduction rate in the, in the likelihood of developing breast cancer. Just uh, interestingly, from increasing the amounts of fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables that they consumed. The article will go on to say further, an adult, an adult sized portion of fresh produce is defined as 80 grams or 2.8 ounces and generally amount to a cup of raw leafy vegetables or half a cup of other raw or cooked fruits and veggies. But that's really not that much. So if you were eating, the women who were eating the minimum amount, the minimum amount of 2.5 servings were basically eating uh, the, the equivalent of a cup of raw leafy vegetables or half a cup of other uh, raw or cooked fruits and veggies, which is interesting. Uh, by eating basically double that amount, they were able to reduce, according to the study, the chances of developing this breast cancer by uh, by 11 percent. So that's that's pretty interesting. And think about if they're eating even more and doing all these other things that we talk about as the eight laws of health. Uh, the article went on to say further. That interesting, interestingly, when the researchers isolated the link between fresh produce consumption and specific types of breast cancer, they found that the higher consumption was specifically linked. To reduction in risk of developing the most aggressive forms of this cancer, specifically HER2 enriched in ER negative and basal like tumors. The article says further that in a previous study, the same research team identified a link between a high fiber intake and breast cancer risk reduction. But in this study, they found that the benefits of higher fruit and veg consumption was unrelated to the amount of fiber consumed. This would indicate, the article says, that other nutrients and antioxidants are likely responsible for the risk of reduction. So think about if you're eating just overall healthy diet, just overall, the kind that I advocate of a total plant-based diet, uh, and also following those other laws of health, trust in the creator. Thus, by trusting in, in the creator and not internalizing stressors and worrying, that in itself could, uh, could significantly reduce the um, the, 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 the the, um, the risks that come from stress. And then think about um, being out in the sunshine where you're getting your vitamin D and then you, and also being outside and getting the exercise and drinking the copious, the right amounts of water and using water both internally and external, externally, eating a plant-based diet, uh, uh, just those laws of health in general. And then under, 
integrating all of these things together. This is what we're talking about today falls under the health law of diet, but just by eating the fruits and vegetables, uh, you were reducing, women are reducing uh, aggressive forms of cancer and tumors uh, just by this one element. So think about if all eight laws were being put into action on a consistent basis. You can see the how dramatically uh, and significantly um, their health can be effective in a positive way just by doing this. This particular article went on to say, quote, although prior studies have suggested an association, they have been limited in power, particularly for specific fruits and vegetables and aggressive subtypes of breast cancer, end quote. And they were quoting Marianne Farvitt, the first author and a research scientist with the Department of Nutrition. They quote further, quote, this research provides the most complete picture of the importance of consuming high amounts of fruit and vegetables for breast cancer prevention. The article went on to say further that while increasing overall consumption of a wide variety of fruits and vegetables would be advisable to reduce breast cancer risk, a previous study conducted by researchers from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School and published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute found that vegetables high in carotenoids are especially beneficial in this regard. So uh, vegetables, one of the ones that you know that are vegetable, or could, it's probably more, more specifically a root, but we consider it a vegetable carrots as one of the ones that's high in carotenoids. There are other ones, but think about it. A lot of times in natural medicine, uh, a lot of institutes will use part of a, of, of a total uh, package of treating cancer. They will use high amounts of, uh, of carrot juice. Now, Carrot juice is good for cancers, but let me uh, uh, warn that in cancers that are hormone-based, which are which is many breast cancers will be, uh, can't, using carrot juice may not be the best option. There are many other options with carotenoids, but that's just uh, as, a, as an aside. Um, the the article is going to say further that that the researchers conducted a meta analysis of the data from eight separate studies on a total of 7,000 women consisting of 80% of all published data on the link between carotenoids and breast cancer. In addition, the researchers reanalyzed all the original blood samples in order to standardize measurements of carotenoid levels. They found that women whose blood was in the top 20% in terms of carotenoid levels were 15 to 20% less likely to develop breast cancer than women whose blood was in the bottom 20%. So again, and you get these carotenoids from the, fruit, the fruits and vegetables, and especially the vegetables, that are high in carotenoids that uh, that you uh, consume. So the article asks, what are carotenoids and which and which vegetables contain the most? Carotenoids are a group of A vitamins that include lycopene, lutein, and beta carotene, and are a potent free radical uh, uh, fighting and are potent rather free radical fighting antioxidants. Uh, and so it's interesting. Uh, and it points out that the veggies that contain the most carotenoids are carrots, like I mentioned earlier, sweet potatoes, and dark green, uh, dark leafy greens, and tomatoes. So again, um, ladies and men as well, but because we're talking about breast cancer and women, you need to be eating your salads. Uh, at least when you're eating your salads, try and eat five different uh, vegetables, but especially having that romaine lettuce. Now, I know a big thing came out this week about the romaine lettuce and the issues, but in general, uh, notwithstanding issues like what came out this week with regard to uh, the uh, E. coli scare with regard to lettuce, uh, you need to be eating your leafy green vegetables, eating your salads, sweet potatoes, uh, carrots, uh, tomatoes. You're getting your carot carotenoids from the vegetables. Because remember, the studies show that as, as, although fruits are very good also to help prevent the vegetables are even more potent, uh, the ones who are sp specifically high in carotenoids. So again, it's very important to know that if you want to reduce uh, by, especially with these vegetables that are high in carotenoids, uh, they said that they were able, these women were able to reduce their levels. The higher the amount of carotenoids in the blood, they were able to, the, the likelihood that they would develop cancer went down by anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. So if you're eating copious amounts of fruits and vegetables, you can actually reduce the likelihood that you can develop or that you will develop breast cancer by up to anywhere from 10 to 20 percent or 11 11 percent to 20 percent that's significant again so um eat your fruits and vegetables fresh fruits and vegetables uh uh and take care of your body and your body will take care of you this is dr keith henry on the face your wellness radio show slash podcast 
uh, you, and you're listening to me here on a Sunday afternoon, if you're listening live, we're going to go over to our next article. We're still in our first segment, the Weekend Natural News Review segment, where we look at two or three articles, talk about them, analyze them that came out in the week. The next one is also, this next article is also from naturalnews.com, and it was entitled, Cancer is Primarily a Metabolic Disorder, Not a Genetic Disease. Yeah, we're talking, I'm going to stay on the, the cancer just a little bit more here. Uh, so, again, the article talks about how cancer is primarily a metabolic disorder, not a genetic disease, because a lot of what you hear these days when it comes to breast cancer, some other cancers, especially breast cancer, but other cancers is that, uh, you know, I, well, I, uh, it's my, I have a genetic propensity to it. And in some cases, there is a genetic propensity. But the majority of cases, especially breast cancer and many other cancers, there is no genetic history. There is no history in the family of having cancer. Uh, and what it, what this, this, to some degree, some of it is propaganda. It, 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 it tricks people into thinking they're going to develop cancer anyway because they have a, the genetic propensity, so they can pretty much not worry about what they eat and how they live because they're going to more than likely develop it anyway. And this is, this is a dangerous mindset to have when in reality, even if you have a genetic propensity to, the, to a particular type of cancer, uh, because there's certainly a lifestyle, the genetic propensity that does not mean that you're going to automatically develop it. Your lifestyle can switch it on. Or if you, ha- or if you have a, a lifestyle that's consistent with eating badly, not exercising, not dealing with stress, or you can keep it switched off by living a healthy lifestyle, eating healthy, etc. Now the article says many of us. The article starts off by saying many of us are under the mistaken impression that getting cancer is very much a case of bad luck, and there is very little we can do to prevent this deadly disease. The truth is, however, that the vast majority of cancers can be avoided through simple lifestyle changes, like maintaining a healthy weight, not smoking, drinking alcohol. It says here their article says drinking alcohol in moderation. I would recommend not drinking alcohol at all. Uh, exercising regularly and eating an organic nutrient dense diet. But then the, the article asks, what about genetic cancers? Isn't it true that there are some cancers which are caused by specific gene, gene mutations, making certain families more susceptible to disease and almost inevitably uh, causing cancer? Uh, and the article goes on to point out, it is, it is in fact true that scientists have identified mutations of certain genes, like the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes which seem to predispose certain women to breast, ovarian, and other cancers. Uh, and so, again, like I said earlier, some people can have a uh, genetic predisposition to it because, why? Because of the way that their mothers or fathers or, or grandmothers or grandfathers or ancestors might have eaten and lived. They might have passed down genetically a genetic predisposition. So, again, think about it for a moment. Whenever you're living a bad lifestyle, if you're eating badly, living badly, you're not just affecting yourself. You are potentially also uh, uh, affecting your future offspring if you have not had offspring yet or if you have had off, have offspring already. Uh, the way that you live, your overall lifestyle, uh, more than likely affected them or could uh, uh, significantly could significantly affect their propensity to develop certain diseases. Now, they can quell those diseases if they don't live a life that's that switches that switch on, that turns that, predis- that predisposition from being uh, just a predisposition to being active. So the article is going to say further that a groundbreaking new study published in the journal Oncotarget recently found that breast cancer is primarily a metabolic disorder and not a genetic disease, which is something we've talked about on here before. Uh, I've always believed that most natural practitioners will believe that as well. Most natural practitioners will know that there may be a genetic predisposition in some cases, but most natu- uh, uh, holistic practitioners will also know that there is more of a metabolic issue there than a, than a genetic issue. According to this article, it says the study was conducted by an international team of 35 researchers from 17 research facilities located in Europe, Brazil, and the United States and included over 1,200 participants. Now, it says for several decades, scientists have been convinced that cancer cells are metabolically different to other cells, but before the advent of mass spectrometry testing, which allowed researchers to precisely analyze, measure, and quantify substances found in blood chemistry, the article says it was impossible for them to prove their theory. Uh, The team 
that we, uh, in this study here that we're talking about use mass spectrometry, according to the article, to measure incredibly small amounts of amino acids, sugars, and lipids in the blood of cancer patients and controlled subjects. They were able, with 95% accuracy, to identify a specific metabolic signature in the cancer patients. This indicates, the article says, that breast cancer patients experience metabolic changes which had predisposed them to developing the disease. Essentially, the researchers found that cancer develops because cancerous cells utilize energy in a different way uh, than normal healthy cells do. So, there's a ma- so it's interesting. He goes on to say that Robert uh, Nagorny, MD, the study's lead author, explained, quote, this suggests that cancer is not a genetic disease arising solely from mutations as we have all been taught but instead a metabolic condition that develops under the stress of cellular nutrient deprivation. So again, essentially, the cells, their, their metabolic, the way that they perform metabolically, metabolically is altered as a result of them being nutritionally deficient. Essentially is what he's saying. He says cells that cannot generate enough energy due, due to lack of oxygen, sugars, or proteins common to many cancers are, are altered metabolic pathways to ensure their survival. I'm sorry, use altered metabolic pathways to ensure their survival. Unfortunately, he says, these cancer cells' success comes at the expense of the host patient. So these cancer cells, in order to, to, to survive, uh, make these metabolic changes, but it do so at your expense if you are the host. And if enough of them uh, can, can proliferate, uh, inside your your cell, inside your body. The article is going to point out further, this indicates that rather than being caused by genetic mutation, breast cancer develops when cells borrow mutated pathways as a result of limits in their nutrient supply. And it is a sobering warning that cancer is even more linked to diet, weight control, and lifestyle than we may previously have thought, says the article. Now, um, most holistic practitioners uh, have always thought that. Most holistic, holistic practitioners, because when you when you're having to work with people who are sick, and you can't depend on the power of drugs that do not heal, but simply but simply uh, help with the symptoms, uh, you get to see what actually works and what does not work. Not merely for survival, but for healing. Um, the article is going to say further, as cancer is increasingly associated with obesity, uh, they quote a news medical life science, and they said, they're quoting news medical life sciences, they quote, quote, as cancer is increasingly associated with obesity, this study provides scientific proof that diet and lifestyle contribute to stresses that in, a predisposed, in predisposed individuals can lead to malignant transformation and death. Finally, the article says, the research team believed that the study offers new hope for the prevention and early diagnosis of breast cancer. Currently, more than a quarter of a million American women are diagnosed with this disease each year, resulting in over 40,000 deaths. And I can remember reading this same statistic probably 15 years ago, and it has not changed that much. So about a quarter of a million of American women, that's roughly, what, 250,000 are diagnosed with breast cancer each year? And about 40,000 of them die. The article points out how, unfortunately, the current screening protocols like mammography and ultrasound cannot detect the disease in its earliest, most curable stage, which is where uh, thermography comes in, which a lot of naturopaths and, and, and holistic practitioners will use thermography to detect uh, areas in the, in the body and certain organs uh, years in advance that show inflammation and inflammation has been one of the markers of cancer being potentially developing in that area of the body so using thermography machine uh, can give a, a very early indication of areas in the body that may be susceptible to cancer or other diseases again which would give uh, for instance if you have get a, a thermography uh, test done and the practitioner sees heat uh, inflammation in the breast or, or et cetera, or maybe in the prostate, and early, maybe years in advance, you can deal with that inflammation now uh, by by doing things in the life to bring down inflammation in the body and stop the cancer from or stop cancer cells from ever developing in the first place. Which is again uh, because the article points out how protocol screening protocols like mammography and ultrasound cannot detect the disease at its earliest and most curable stage. Again, 
cancer, like many other things, uh, is, is the, the likelihood that you can reverse or cure it goes up significantly when you can catch it early, very significantly, even in natural medicine. Now, natural medicine has has uh, has proven to be heroic even at mid and late stages. But why why uh, let it get to a mid or late stage if you can catch it early? Uh, it's far better to do so. I'm Dr. Keith Henry. You are listening to the Phase Through Wellness podcast and radio show. Uh, we are um, we are in our, we're still in our first uh, segment, which is the Week of National News Review segment. We're looking at a few articles that came out during the week discussing and analyzing them. Just finished our first two. We will talk about our third article now, which is this article is taken uh, and it is taken from Nutrient.News, Nutrient.News, and it's entitled COQ10 Demonstrates Tremendous Health Benefits for Fighting Illnesses Like Breast Cancer and Heart Disease. Now, COQ10 is actually one of my favorite supplements uh, by far. I take it myself, and I would highly recommend that uh, you look into potentially taking COQ10. And we'll talk about it's what's often called a poor man's option which is not really a poor man option when you think about it. And uh, when we talk about our healing herbs segment, we'll talk about hawthorn berry. Uh, and it used, when, when COQ10 first came out, it was a lot more expensive than it is now. So many people considered it hawthorn berry, which we'll talk about in our healing herbs segment, the poor man's version of, of uh, COQ10. And, and it could be considered that only to the extent that they both are very, very beneficial for the heart. But we'll talk about hawthorn berry in a, uh, when we get to that final segment. But with respect to COQ10, uh, in this article, it says COQ10, the, the, the article title is COQ10 demonstrates tremendous health benefits for fighting illnesses like breast cancer and heart disease. Again, it's from Nutrient.News. It came out during this week. The article starts off by saying it's widely appreciated for its powerful antioxidant and cell energizing properties. Talking about COQ10. It says, but the nutrient COQ10, also known as COQ10 or coenzyme Q10, does a whole lot more than just clean up free radicals and improve cardiovascular function in humans. And then it, the article states or cites studies that indicate how COQ10 is an amazing anti-cancer nutrient that can actually help to not only prevent but also reverse breast and other forms of cancer while also helping to prevent and mitigate heart disease. Then the article cites uh, a study published in the journal Melanoma Research. And where this study, they found that patients taking 400 milligrams per day of COQ10, along with an immune-boosting drug, saw their risk of uh, metastasis, metastasis, I'm sorry, which is the spread of the disease, drop by as much as 1,300% with no harmful side effects, uh, it pointed out. Now, interestingly enough, there are some people who choose to go uh, with, uh, with uh chemo or whatnot, they, they choose to, to go the, to take the drug route. One of the things that, and, you know, I, I, I encourage people to, to go the natural route. I encourage people that they have a better survival rate if they, if they go the natural route as opposed to, say, going with chemotherapy and radiation. If a person decides to go that way, I, you know, I don't begrudge them. It's their life. They have to choose. But even when they go with chemotherapy, one of the things that can actually help offset some of the uh, – uh, the terrible side effects of chemotherapy is COQ10. Uh, and so, again, if you, you know, even though I don't advocate going that way, if you're a person that's choosing to go that way and you want to uh, eliminate some of the side effects of, uh, of the chemotherapy, I would recommend that you maybe consult with a natural practitioner uh, uh, and let them know that, you know, what you're doing and, uh and maybe get their get their advice and recommendation with respect to the amounts of COQ10 uh, that they recommend that you take uh, with while you're taking your chemo or whatever. Again, I'm not advocating taking chemo. I would advocate not taking it. Uh, I I believe that you stand a better chance of survival by doing a very strong natural based protocol uh, with a knowledgeable uh, person to work with you. But again, ultimately you have to make that decision because it is your life. Uh, and so, again, the article is going to point out how other studies have found that COQ10 also helps to, to slow the growth of cancer tumors. The article says researchers believe that it does this by supporting reductions in inflammation throughout the body as well as by suppressing the vascular mechanism inside tumors that keep them alive and function. Uh, the article also points out how low levels of COQ10 have been associated with many types of cancer, 
including cancer of the breast, of the lung, of the pancreas, the prostate, the kidney, the colon, the neck, and the head. It says that patients diagnosed with myeloma and lymphoma have also shown signs of inadequate CoQ10 levels, suggesting that a lack of this important nutrient could actually be a direct cause of the disease. So again, we, we were talking about earlier how when cells, the metabolic reason that cells uh, become cancerous and go off on their own is that they, they like nutrients. And CoQ10 is actually one of the nutrients that the body needs. Uh, I'm not saying that's the only one that it needs to help prevent cancer, but it is a significant nutrient that, that is needed by the body. Now, the, uh, the article is going to point out that as far as heart disease is concerned, COQ10 is considered by many to be a wonder supplement for heart health. It is. Now, for COQ10, it, it helps with cancer, but really it's, it's seen to be primarily a very, very efficient supplement for heart health. The article points out how taking COQ10 has been shown to help improve the pro-BNP numbers associated with stressed heart tissue in turn, minimizing the risk of total heart failure and subsequent death. Uh, and it goes on to show how, how the active form of COQ10, also known as ubiquinol, acts as a powerful deterrent against congestive heart failure. And then they cite a, a researcher from Texas uh, found that taking 500 milligrams daily of ubiquinol increased patients' plasma blood, blood levels fourfold. And citing the study, they say, quote, the improvement in plasma COQ10 levels in, in correlated, and again, this is a study uh, from researchers from the University of Texas, uh, or researchers rather from Texas, according to the article. It says, quote, the improvement in plasma COQ10 levels is correlated with both clinical improvement and improvement in measurement of left ventricular function, ventricular function, the team wrote in their paper, which was published in the journal BioFactors. Citing another study, the article says that was published in the journal Nutrition and Metabolism found that taking COQ10 uh, along with other potent antioxidant nutrients such as vitamin C, vitamin E, and selenium helps to improve small and large arterial elasticity, consequently reducing blood pressure levels and decreasing risk of heart attack. And down the article then goes on to point out that we should remember how COQ10 levels actually do decline with age. They point out, quote, the, the reason why it's critical to supplement with COQ10 in order to obtain these benefits is that levels of this antioxidant enzyme, which is naturally produced by the body, tend to decline with age. This means that the elderly are especially in need of it in supplemental form as it can help to restore natural balance. Uh, then they cite uh, Life Extension Magazine. Um, they cite and they say that, that Life Extension Magazine points to published science in claiming that a proper COQ10 regimen can help to add as many as nine additional years onto a person's life, which is certainly nothing to scoff at. Uh, and they, again, they say for this reason, COQ10 is often referred to as the longevity factor, an anti-aging powerhouse that helps to protect not only the heart, which is true for maintaining human life, but also the entire cellular system. So you can see why COQ10 is actually one of my favorite supplements. Then they are uh, quoting Lena uh, Bucking, uh, Buchanan, uh, who writes for Extension, Life Extension Magazine. They quote her where she says, quote, there's evidence for COQ10's protective efforts in the brain and nervous system, in asthma and chronic lung disease, in diabetes and the metabolic system, uh, on, on ocular health, and even on the aging immune system. Saying further, most excitingly, there's early support for the idea that COQ10 supplementation can extend the lifespan of both primitive animals and mammals, laying the groundwork for a similar pro-longevity effect in humans. So, again, uh, also I've seen studies and know people who actually who had who actually helped take uh, certain amounts of COQ10 who had severe severe kidney failure and or, or headed toward kidney failure and COQ10. There have been studies, uh, and also not only studies, but people, clinical studies and clinical outcomes where people who have taken COQ10 have been able to, re who are on their way to renal failure, who have been able to reverse or slow down or halt altogether that, 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 uh, uh, that failure. So, again, COQ10 is a very, very, very important nutrient. It benefits the heart. It ben as we just read, it benefits the entire system. It benefits, especially the heart, it also is benefits I didn't mention this or it wasn't mentioned in the article, but it also benefits the uh the health of the gums. Uh it brings oxygen because it's an antioxidant. So it's very, very beneficial 
for uh, 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 oral health. Again, uh, it's, I highly recommend that you look into COQ10. Uh, we make it available at, at uh, our Phase 3 Wellness website as well, phase3wellness.com. We, make a, we, we recommend this, and I use a particular uh, brand from Diva, which is a, a plant-based or vegan version. It's a, it's, it is a sublingual version. Uh, where you take it, of course, put it on your tongue, or just suck on it, and it dissolves in your mouth quite, quite easily, and you get the benefits and through that um, uh, uh, way, as opposed to having to take it and it going down, going down to your gastrointestinal tract. Not that that doesn't have some benefits, but uh, you want to get as much of it as you can. There are also some on the market now that are lipo form, uh, which is, has a very, very high level of. Uh, of uh, absorbability into the system as a whole. Again, this is Dr. Keith Henry. You are listening to the Phase Through Wellness Podcast and Blog, uh, Blog Talk Radio radio show. Uh, thank you for joining me so far. We're going to pivot into our next segment now, which is our healing food segment. Our healing food segment. Now, the healing food segment again is if you're not listening, if this is your first time listening, or if you've not listened before, is where I discuss a particular food that uh, and some of the benefits, nutritional benefits of your food, of that food and how it benefits the body, some of the science behind it. Sometimes we talk about everything from walnuts to okra to whatever. Uh, and we've talked about it. Sometimes we repeat certain foods because sometimes new research comes out or new evidence comes out on additional benefits of that food. Now, today we've already talked about in our, uh, earlier in, this, in our first segment how fruits and vegetables benefit women and reduce the likelihood of them developing breast cancer. But today we're going to talk about a what is not commonly known as a superfood, uh, and it's normally taken in the form of a juice or uh, as opposed to just uh, eating in a food in the sense of sitting down eating it like you're eating solid food. But again, it's still a food. It's called spirulina. spirulina. Uh, and it's been known in natural health to get nutrients, a uh, high a density, high level of densified nutrients into the cells, into the body. And so, again, that uh, we're, so we'll look at it in terms of a food because that's essentially what it is. Spirulina is actually a microalgae, and it's known for its, distinct, its distinctive blue-green color. And it has been consumed for many years, normally in juice form by people uh, that want to keep getting a high, high, high level of dense nutrients into their bodies, into to their cells. It, it actually grows naturally in subtropical salty lakes and ocean, and it's very rich in nutrients. It is rich in nutrients according to the FDA even. It contains significant, amount, significant amounts of iron, of magnesium, of vitamin B, of the, your B vitamins. It has significant amounts of calcium, of potassium, and of niacin. It is also rich in protein, uh, which accounts for about 7% of its drug weight, basically considered it's, it's basically considered a complete plant-based protein source as it also contains all the essential amino acids. Uh, so again, just from the get-go, spirulina is full. It's, it's nutrient-dense. Uh, now, one of, the biggest, so one of the biggest benefits that's been associated with spirulina is its ability to help boost the immune system or to boost the overall immunity. Uh, again, we should expect this to be the case because it's very high in these in these minerals and vitamins and essential essential acids, essential amino acids, I'm sorry, essential amino acids. Uh, and but it also has uh, things to help to boost the immune system. Uh, just overall. Studies actually show that it stimulates the immune system by creating immune uh, cytokines that the body signals when it fights off infections. In fact, there was a study published in cellular and molecular immunology and in this study they found that supplementing for about twelve weeks with six tablets of 500 milligram uh, spirulina per day was associated with an increase in white blood cell counts, hence an increase in your uh, immune system. There's also other studies that show that spirulina can help fight cancer, which, of course, if it's going to boost your immune system and also provide the body with nutrients, of course, it's going to fight cancer. There was a study published in the Annals of Hepatology uh, uh, hepatology, and it shows that it could even be useful in fighting one of the most aggressive cancers, the two types of cancers today, which is pancreatic cancer. And again, pancreatic cancer is indeed one of the most deadly 
uh, an aggressive type of cancer. And, and in this particular study that I'm referring to here, the researchers found that all of the pancreatic cancer cells from humans and mice that were treated with spirulinian tests noted a substantial inhibition of cancerous cell proliferation. So again, this is another uh, benefit of this superfood. Uh, there's also been some, some research and, and studies that show that spirulina can also be highly beneficial for your heart because of its ability to help to reduce cholesterol. There was a study published in the Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism, for example, that showed that older adults who took 8 grams, or 8, 000, which, is a, which is the same as 8,000 milligrams of spirulina per day, noted significant cholesterol reduction at the end of 16 weeks. And then there was a different study in the, that confirmed that this effect uh, show, showing that adults from between the age of 37 and 61 who took a gram of spirulina, spirulina per day had also lower uh, total cholesterol numbers. Uh, not only and all, not only their lower, not only did lower their total cholesterol numbers, but also lower their back cholesterol or their LDL, as well as their triglyceride at the end of 12 weeks. So again, there's also the fact that that heart disease is considered a, uh, a chronic inflammatory disease. So again, we're talking about inflammation. Anything that can help reduce inflammation in the body can help reduce the the likelihood that you're going to develop a disease of some type, some type. Uh, and so, but my spirulina, again, being rich in so many nutrients, help fight inflammation and thus can help hinder the likelihood that cancer, diabetes, or many other diseases that can develop based upon inflammation and, and uh, nutritional deficiencies. Uh, it can help stave, stave off those, those problems because, because of all of the benefits that are contained on you know, the nutrients rather that are contained in spirulina. Uh, again, so it was briefly whenever you, if you, you can, you can, you can supplement with spirulina, you can you know, buy spirulina capsules. Some people like to juice, uh, take the, the juice and uh, they take it in, in juice form uh, on a daily basis. And again, it is, it is considered a superfood and it's food. And especially if you're sick. Now, of course, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, by taking it daily or by taking it every other day or, or ing ingratiating it into your your daily or weekly um, uh, lifestyle, you can, uh, along with other healthy lifestyle cho choices, you can significantly reduce the likelihood of even ever developing these diseases by because by taking things like spirulina, you can help, again, keep infl inflammation down in the body. Uh, and But, again, I like to hasten to remind you that not only is it important to keep inflammation down the body uh, by taking supplements and eating healthy, but you, it's, it's the number one thing that can drive up uh, an inflammatory, uh, by, uh, drive up the likelihood that you, will, that you will develop an inflammatory internal environment in the body is emotional factors, stressors, anger, uh, 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 negativity, it, negative emotions, all these things will also cause uh, 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 acid blood and hence inflammation, acid fluids, and hence inflammation in the body. So again, remember, deal with emotion, emotional wellness, emotional fitness, spiritual fitness. These things help deal, keep calm and not to worry and stress over the things that you can't control anyway. So, again, you are listening to Phase 3 Wellness. I am your host, Dr. Keith Henry. We are about to uh, go into our last segment, which is our uh, healing herb segment. And, uh, and so, again, the healing herb we're going to be talking about today is the herb of uh, hawthorn berry. Now, hawthorn berry is, um, hawthorn berry is, is, again, as I said earlier, Considered in some circles, it has been considered a poor man's uh, COQ10. Uh, and when people were talking about it in terms of its benefit for the heart. But hawthorn berry is in itself an incredible, incredible herb. And let's look at some of its benefits. Hawthorn berry is in, in herbal medicine is actually used uh, in, for many reasons, but primarily it's, it's considered to be a heart tonic or a heart or herb that's. That, benefits the heart and so and it does hawthorn hawthorn contain compounds that support the heart and as well as the circulatory system it's actually used regularly again 
to protect against the beginning stages of heart disease. It's also excellent to help speed recovery from a heart attack. So if you or someone else, you, someone that you know has heart, had a heart attack uh, and you're trying to recover for it, from it, one of the things that can ben- help benefit uh, a recovery is hawthorn berry. COQ10 as well, but hawthorn berry since we're talking about the herb. Now, let's look at some of the nutrients that, that uh, are contained in hawthorn berry. Hawthorn berry, not, we're not, we're, it's not going to go to all of them, but just some of them. Uh, hawthorn berry contains, for instance, vitamin A. It contains vitamin C. Uh, it has sodium, selenium, potassium, chromium, niacin, and about 19 other nutrients. So, again, it in its own right, it is a powerhouse. Again, it's, it's another food that the Creator has given us to help, to help us uh, to benefit us. And, again, it's, it's very beneficial for the heart, very, very beneficial. Uh, it's an antioxidant. And Hawthorne appears uh, scientifically. Now, I want to go over here and cite a, a, uh, a, a study by the Michigan, the University of Michigan with respect to Hawthorne berry, or against Hawthorne. Because in Hawthorne, not the berries or leaves, sometimes the limbs, I mean, I'm sorry, the stems are used and also the leaves. But the, according to the University of Michigan, the antioxidant Hawthorne appears to reduce, and I'm quoting here, symptoms and improve and, and, and improve exercise capacity by increasing blood flow to the heart and the strength of heart contraction and reducing resistance to blood flow in the extremities. Clinical trials have shown that standardized extracts made from the leaves and flowers of Hawthorne are effective in helping people with early stage CHF or congestive heart failure. That's again, that's from the University of Michigan. Now think about that. The University of Michigan, uh, based upon their studies of Hawthorne, are actually pointing out that Hawthorne, and we're not even talking about the berries. We're talking about they're talking about uh, the clinical trials uh, that showed the standardized extracts from the leaves and the flowers. And look at what they what they found that it's an antioxidant. First off, that it reduced symptoms. It appears to reduce symptoms and improve exercise capacity by increasing blood flow to the heart. So. It actually can help athletes by increasing uh, uh, exercise capacity, by increasing blood flow to the heart and the strength of heart contra- uh, contraction and reducing resistance to blood flow in the extremities. And again, it also pointed out how clinical trials have shown that standardized extracts made from the leaves and flowers of Hawthorne berries, of Hawthorne rather, are effective in helping people with early stages of congestive heart failure. So again, we're talking about Hawthorne berry here and the benefits of it of Hawthorne berry for people with heart issues. So if you remember, heart issues, heart disease, circulatory issues are the number one killer uh, uh, in America. And so, again, the, the, we should understand that if, if, if heart disease and related diseases, cardiovascular diseases, uh, and just overall diseases dealing with our circulation are the number one killers, Hawthorne should be very, very high on our list when we're looking at helping our heart and strengthening in our heart. Now, let's, uh, let's look at what, what the University of Michigan has said further. They say, quote, Hawthorne extracts appear to increase blood flow to the heart, increase the strength of heart contractions, reduce resistance to blood flow in the extremities, and act as an antioxidant. And they say, in a large preliminary trial, people with mild to moderate CHF uh, congestive heart failure were given 300 milligrams of hawthorne flour and leaf extract standardized to 2.2 percent flavonoids three times a day for two months symptoms of congestive heart failure including heart palpitations chest pressure and swelling in the extremities extremities decreased throughout the trial during the use of hawthorne the efficacy of Hawthorne for the treatment of congestive heart failure has been confirmed in a double-blind trial. And now, again, they use standardized extracts. Now, let me be clear on what standardized a- extracts are. Uh, a standardized extract is basically uh, many times in herbal medicine or in uh, natural medicine, they will determine they will determine that uh, the the active constituent in a in a, in a herb 
is X. And so they say, okay, so we're going to take this active, this active constituent and we're going to standardize it throughout all of the bottles of herbs that we make. So we're going to say, we're going to say, say there's 100 milligrams of this, of whatever it is that they found to be the, 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 the main ingredient that is getting that is giving you the benefit so and they would standardize it and say and so in every batch you will have a hundred milligrams of whatever it is now and then they would standardize that across all of the entire batch so if you get a bottle of and it says standardized extract of x then uh for every two capsules you take you're going to get a hundred milligrams guaranteed supposedly uh in that and the reason they say they standardize is because when you take the loose herb depending on you might get a batch that you may have uh uh say for every two capsules you take there may be 300 milligrams of the of the active herb where in the next batch it may be 100 milligrams so the idea of standardizing it is to say okay in in each batch that you take it's going to be 200 milligrams uh, in every in every in every two capsules you take, for instance, if that's the if that's the serving. Now, the downside of that is that um, whenever we whenever they uh, uh, basically zero in on what they say is the the active constituent, the way the creator has put these herbs together is that the nutrients they work in tandem or they work synergistically. Uh, with the other nutrients that are contained in it. Many times the other nutrients that they're supporters of the main nutrient and help with it, they may help it, they may help with its uh, absorption or whatever else. Uh, and so that's the downside. Now there is a place sometimes to use standardized extracts, don't get me wrong, but, uh, and there's also a place for using just loose herbs. Now with Hawthorne, if you just if you have a batch of just say for instance when I say loose herbs, let's say if you went out and you picked some hawthorn berries or you went out and you picked the leaves and stems and you grounded them up and you put them in capsules yourself, uh, depending on the, the, the nature of the soil, whatnot, is going to determine how powerful or how strong that batch of, of uh, hawthorn berry is, as opposed to them going out and standardizing the amount um, uh, if they standardize it as opposed to using just using leaf or er, loose herb and, and bottling it or whatnot. So again, both and then Hawthorne is one of the few herbs that tend to work better when it's standardized. But if you but uh, if you use Hawthorne berry in an unstandardized form, it's recommended that you take about four to six grams of the whole herb, which would be four to six thousand milligrams to get the same amount, the benefit. Uh, that they pointed out in the study, uh, and uh, to get the same amount of benefit of the 300 milligrams of the standardized Hawthorne. So again, that's the difference. Like I said, I like personally using the loose herbs. Uh, they've been taking, you know, say you have uh, a number of herbs where you basically ground them up. Sometimes people may purchase them from certain suppliers, ground already ground, and they may buy them loosely and they may combine them together. That I found those to be, I find it to be very, 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 very efficient. Uh, again, that's not to say there are not times when uh, it may be good to use standardized herbs, but I just tend to prefer a little bit more using the uh, uh, herbs unstandardized. And again, like I said before, there are some cases Hawthorne is one of the few that tend to be one of the ones that work more efficacious. Uh, but again, if you choose to not use the standardized form. Uh, you need to take more. Uh, the University of Michigan went on to say further, quote, the fruit, leaves, and flowers of the Hawthorne tree contain flavonoids, which may protect blood vessels from damage. They say a 60 milligram Hawthorne extract containing 18.75% uh, uh, of cyanidins taken three times per day improve heart function and exercise tolerance in angina patients in a small clinical trial. Interesting. Also, they they also cite a German uh, study, which showed that a Hawthorne extract worked nearly as well as a prescription heart failure drug, uh, Captopril, and the Hawthorne extract had fewer side effects, which is going to be the case in almost all, in virtually all cases. Herbs, in general, because of the way that they work in the body, are going to very um, um, almost never have uh, the same side effects as a drug. 
Um, and again, there are some herbs that you need to uh, you need to use caution when using them. But most of the time, you would have to take significant significant amounts of herbs, uh, and sometimes in their most concentrated form, to 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 do any anywhere near the type of negative side effect that you're going to get from drugs. That's not to say that you are to to use herbs haphazardly because there are some herbs that can cause some serious side effects uh, that you would not be pleased with. But generally speaking, uh, you would have to take uh, to even get near the place of where you're going to deal with the negative side effects uh, that can be caused by drug medication. Now, again, I'm not here saying that there is never a time that it may not be necess- that it may not be necessary that you may need to have drug medication to save your life. You could be hit uh, involved in a car accident where they need the drugs to to save you, and then after you're stabilized or to stabilize you, again. So I don't mean to say that there's never a role for allopathic medicine. For uh, I don't mean to be interpreted as saying that, but the fact of the matter is is that uh, herbal medicine, natural medicine, has a place and it has a significant place. It really should be our primary medicine when we're dealing with diseases and sicknesses because that is primarily where most of the money that we spend in healthcare. Is it goes primarily toward chronic diseases, diseases like heart disease and diabetes and uh, cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people having the uh, emotional issues and you know antidepressant drugs, all of these things. And if we would take time and alter our diets, look into some herbs and supplements that can actually help replace certain uh, chemicals in the body naturally, we can we would have to not have to worry about dealing so much with some of the, even the cost. So again, some people are thrown into even more sickness when considering the cost that they're going to have to come up with or the money they're going to have to come up with because of the cost. So uh, again, uh, we shouldn't live in a in a time where trying to be made well is going to make you sicker. And again, we've talked about this before that one of the reasons that we have the, the great fight against natural medicine is because there's so much money to be made and you have very powerful interests in the pharmaceutical companies and the medical industry and the politicians who, uh, who, whose, whose campaigns are funded uh, by many of these big companies. Uh, and so, again, when you, have, when you have those interests against, uh, against you, there's going to be a, a problem. But the people as a whole are over, over years and decades now have been coming wiser, uh, becoming wiser and wiser to the benefits of natural healing, of herbs, of supplements, of essential oils, of the benefits of uh, vitamins and minerals, etc., and the benefits of living a healthy lifestyle, drinking plenty of water, getting plenty of sunshine, having a faith uh, that they can trust in their creator, uh, getting adequate amounts of rest and sleep, drinking adequate amounts of water, using water for healing properties both internally and externally, hydrotherapy, just a whole uh, 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 a lifestyle change. Again, and so many people who are on medications and they don't like it anymore, they don't like the side effects, they turn to natural remedies or whatnot, and they like the benefits that they're they're receiving. Again, this is this is what's causing natural medicine and natural remedy to have be uh, and wellness to be making such a comeback. That people are finally beginning to understand that uh, there is a better way. I believe that, of course, that natural medicine is a better way. Uh, again, that's not to say that, as I said before, that allopathic uh, medicine does not have its role. But by and large, uh, when we go, when, when we follow what uh, some of the laws that I've been talking about today, and we look to wellness and prevention instead of just uh, of treating symptoms, we'll find ourselves... Uh, in a very well place, we would we were we would have uh, less cost. We would have more wellness. We would have more mental wellness, which would which would be less violence, uh, less negativity, uh, more more just a just a just an overall better way to live, and, and an environment in which to exist. You have been listening to Phase Three Wellness Podcast and Radio Show. I am your host, Dr. Keith Henry. We are finally uh, going to be uh, getting down here into our final minutes, uh, last few seconds of the show. I want to thank you for listening, for joining me here. 
If you came in at the end of the show, the show will be available, the entire show, in about probably five to seven minutes. Thank you for listening. Until next time, have a good week, and God bless.